So we're now we are looking at. Like Adam mentioned, failure of the radial gates again, or tainter gates, same same type of gates, under a seismic loading. So for our learning objectives, we'll talk about the failure mechanisms for these type of gates, identify an analysis procedures for evaluating the gates, and list key considerations for estimating risk for this potential failure mode. I will say up, up front that this there is no known case histories of this type of failure having occurred. Nonetheless, it is a possibility, so it is considered a potential failure mode. So we'll start again with uh, the load, the load path. So with the water on the skin plate and rib shown in purple, that gets transferred, that load gets transferred into the girders running horizontally shown in green. That load then gets transferred into the strut arms, which again is the crit one, the critical uh, component of a radial gate. That once those buckle, you're typically going to fail the fail the radial gate. Uh, those strut arms are braced by the the bracing shown in blue, and then all that load gets transferred into the trunnion hub and assembly shown in yellow here. So the difference between this major difference that from this and the normal operating condition failure of the radial gates is that these gates are not being operated during a seismic event. So they are resting, the gate is resting on the sill. You don't assume that these gates are being operated to pass flows at the same time that you get a seismic event. So you don't, we're not considering the trunnion friction in this case. It's just the gate with the water load on there. And then again, the big difference in seismic is now you have a hydrodynamic load from the water. Briefly rehashing this as well. So the failure mechanisms is a buckling of that strut arm, and that can happen by yielding, which is inelastic buckling, which that's a case where you get these shorter columns where you're more likely to get inelastic buckling, where your material, uh, the, the stress doesn't exceed that critical buckling load. And then uh, buckling is for these longer columns that you'll see, and then fatigue that you can have that often that would lead to yielding or buckling of the member. So for this potential failure mode, you have the seismic load ranges that you need to consider. Um, you have the pool range that you need to consider for the for the loading of the gates. And then you have the initiation, which is the onset of the buckling, which is calculating that interaction ratio of the of the strut arm. And this is based on analysis and looking at a fragility curve and the team discussing and deciding a probability probability of this event occurring. And then we look at a breach. Is there a breach of the reservoir or is intervention possible? Uh, the intervention is also based on some, ex, some factors that may result in intervention being possible. This could be structural redundancy. Maybe you have a, a a gate arm that has three or four strut arms, that there could be redistribution of stress. So you do get onset of buckling of one of the members, but it doesn't fail. I mean, maybe you could make the case on the, the previous case study there with the Corps of Engineers at, at Foster Dam that the, the strut on the top strut arm was showing signs of buckling, but it didn't fail the member. So some of the so structural redundancy, the wire ropes, um, also the maybe there's an emergency closure bulkhead that can be set under under flowing water. So for loading, for the simplified methods, we usually look at pseudo-static. Um, you need to always look at the self-weight of the member, the gate inertia load, the hydrodynamic load, and of course, still the hydrostatic load is acting on the gate at this point. And it must be the loading must be corrected for other dynamic effects, the duration of loading, and if we have if I haven't mentioned enough amplification, you know, I'll mention it again too. Uh, the hydrostatic load on the gate is is pretty straightforward. It's just calculating the water pressure on the gate. That load, that Y was not the centroid. The centroid, of course, acts at the third third up from the base. But it's the just the normal pressure distribution from water. So the big difference, the big loading factor on this on this gate for this potential failure mode is hydrodynamic loading. Um, so I have a pretty impressive equation too. I don't know if this competes 
with yours, Manel, or with Keith's, but it's fun. Um, the, uh, this is Westergaard's exact solution. Um, again, just with a show of hand, who's familiar at all with Westergaard's added mass? Whether it be the exact solution or the approximate solution. Well, we're going to be looking at the exact solution for loads on a radial gate. And so they're highlighted in blue is the, the Westergaard's exact solution. So some things to keep in mind with Westergaard, some of the assumptions that went into this. This was developed for a rigid dam with a vertical face. And oftentimes these assumptions aren't always true, especially when you're talking about gates that are not vertical and that are offset from the face of the dam. But it's been proven that the Western Guards, or it is thought to be a reasonable assumption to calculate the hydrodynamic loads. The amplification, so this next part of the equation is the gate inset correction factor. So it's been shown that because the Western Guards, the assumptions that were made that these gates at the top of the dam are usually set back a certain distance. And so from some research and some modeling, there's a correction factor that's been made that reduces the load at the gate level because of the because of it being inset. And here's the amplification factor, or the mention of the amplification factor again. So the AG is the acceleration, but you also have to make sure you consider amplification. Um, some sim there are some simplified methods to calculate this. There's Chopra's pseudo pseudodynamic method. Um, so there there are simple simple methods to get that amplification versus doing a finite element model. Uh, the video there just shows the the cyclic nature of the hydrodynamic loading on the structure. So the pseudostatic pseudo correction, we've talked alluded, alluded to it a little bit in other um, sessions here, but it accounts for the fact that the peak acceleration only occurs a time or two during the entire earthquake. And this is comes from EM2100 that allows the use of this 0.67 factor. Um, just a little more, again, knowing that that's not... <laughs> Not the, the right answer. There are certain cases where if you have a taller period, a, a taller dam that may have a higher period, you may want to use a higher number for that. Um, and then kind of whole walk through of how you may want to determine how you can determine that. So if we look at the ground motion shown here, a time history, there's your peak ground acceleration, the highest point. And then if we draw in the 0.67 PGA line, you would see that there would be one, two, three excursions where you would, uh, would where you would exceed that and given the short duration of that loading it's been determined and there's been um, consultants uh, seed and Yusuf Ganat who have looked at this and agree with using this factor for a pseudostatic analysis and so again you have this those few peaks that may exceed it so for a taller dam that may have a higher period, if you look at that PGA value and then you go in and draw your 0.67 line, 0.67 PGA, you'll see one, two, three, up to seven or so peaks that exceed that. So at that point, you may not feel as comfortable saying that, you know, my structure is going to stay elastic in this range and you may make a determination that it may be a little, a little more, um, may more, make more sense, a little more conservative, or more realistic to to choose a, a smaller, or I'm sorry, a higher ratio, like a 0.85, instead of a 0.67, to reduce your loads by. Uh, this is again, uh, this would be a discussion with the with the risk team um, and the risk analysis, and that would, if you're doing analysis based on this, that would need to happen ahead of time prior to the risk analysis. But again, these assumptions that were made and uh, documenting why they were made and justifying them. So within this, uh, within this equation that has the sum of from n to zero to infinity, uh, the n is the mode shapes of the structure. And so we're not going to run this to infinity. But you do want to look at enough mode shapes 
that you get a percent difference is small enough that you feel comfortable with, um, but also considering computation time. And why this is important, so if you're looking at the entire dam and you're running this equation, you would see that with just a very few mode shapes, usually one or two, one or two, uh, less than five, that you would be getting a percent difference that would be acceptable. But for this case, in this dam where the spillway is on top of the dam, in order to use this exact solution, you'd have to run uh, quite, a, quite a few more mode shapes to be able to get within a percent, percent difference. So that graph is just showing the, the dark blue portion of it and the mo number of mode shapes and the percent difference that you get to where you're, you're getting the right um, basically, I'd say in this in this in this graph, the area through the curve that your percent difference is small enough. And generally, this would, I think I mentioned generally this would be about ten mode shapes would be considered acceptable. Uh, this t value here um, is generally assumed to be one point three three seconds. I think this is the period of the earthquake. If you start using really low values, then you get really high numbers that are, are unreasonable. So it's typically suggested to use 1.33 seconds for that period. And so the, the blue line here is shown is the Westergaard's exact solution. So you, if you're familiar with Westergaard's exact, you're probably familiar with Westergaard's approximate solution, which is a much more, much, much more generous equation to, uh, to use. That's that 7 8 square root of y over h. And maybe if you've done stability analysis of concrete dams, you've used the approximate solution, and that's been, that's been pretty close. Because if you look at the entire height of the dam, the difference between the blue line and that red line is pretty small, something that could be is acceptable for a pseudo-static type of analysis. But again, in this case where we're looking at the top of the dam, the difference of that in that curve gets quite large. It's something that's, you know, you wouldn't feel as comfortable using that. It's the, the approximate solution in this case would be uh, quite conservative to use that. And so it just that just shows showing the difference of the difference between the exact solution and the approximate solution. So again, for these cases, uh, the, using the exact solution would be recommended. So looking at the distribution hydrodynamic load on the gate, the hydrodynamic pressure is proportional to the acceleration, and so you can break this up into as many many small as small many number of sections as you want and include those as lumped masses onto your onto your model to replicate the hydrodynamic loads. So just walking us through some of the other loadings on the gates, always you'd always have to you know, always have to include the self weight of members and the inertial load from the self weight. If you're doing a hand calc, you would have to calculate the weight, make sure you're hitting close to the center of mass of the of the members. The finite element models it includes that it um, it's just built into when you model the section correctly with the right members it includes the in gate inertial load as long as you have that mass participating in the earthquake. So this walks again some of the load path as well. So for some of the loads from on from the skin plate into the girders there's often a, a small moment that can be transferred but that's usually ignored in a simple hand calc, but a finite element model would account for that. So those are then transferred as axial loads into the, into the girders and into the struts. This just shows a moment diagram coming from the girders into the, into the strut arms. And it, it just showing it induces a moment there. And then again, this uh, this gate is not being lifted. It's not being rotated at this point. So in the model, you're you got to figure out the boundary condition of how to model the the end the trunnion assembly there. Oftentimes, it depends on the connection there for sleeve bearings. It's often assumed to be fixed, so that would induce a moment there at the at the end of your gate 
where the trunnion is, or if you have spherical bearings, oftentimes that's modeled and assumed to be a pin connection. And this way you can calculate. So there is some moment in the, the strut arms. A lot of this is controlled by the axial load, which we'll see, but there is some moment into those arms. So calculating the capacity, this gets back into, again, a minimum compressive strength or the minimum specified yield strength of steel. Oftentimes these older gates are A36 steel, so they have the 36 KSI, what we assume for the yield capacity. But in this FEMA 355A document, it has shown that the mean of this type of steel is really closer to 44 KSI, and the ultimate is much more than the 60 KSI. So that's something, again, to consider in a risk analysis framework where we're, we're pushing these structures to the, to the limit or what we really expect them, the, the strength to be, not, the, not just taking the minimum values. So to calculate the interaction ratio of those strut arms, which is the key component, which goes into the fragility curve, this is the equations that are come from the, from the steel manual. And the, the P is the axial load, the M, R, X is the major axis bending, and then M, Y is the minor axis bending of those strut arms. And so, again, when we're looking at the demand, we should be looking at those without load factors. This needs to be stripped out in the analysis. And if we look at the bottom of the equations, that's the capacity portion of it, and for the capacity, those resistance factors should be taken out. You're using one for those instead of a reduction. So we're looking at weak axis moment for the strut arms. Um, generally has minimum impact at the controlling load cases. And as I mentioned, uh, a lot of this is the loading is compression into the strut arms, and that's what's controlling and dominating the interaction ratio. So when you're looking at buckling of these strut arms, what effective length should be used that has a big impact on the buckling, the buckling um, of the members? So typically, those braces that are in the strut arms are bracing the weak axis of the member. And then so in, through the model, we using the 3D finite element modeling, you would be able to get all the stresses and all the members, but here is shown specifically in the braces. And you can see the, the one on the bottom closest to the, to the pin is approaching, approaching the limit of an interaction ratio of one. So, you know, it's still there. It's still acting as a brace. But if you do these models and you start seeing these braces that are um, exceeding one for the demand capacity ratio, then you may need to take those out of the model, run it again, and see, and see what happens if it's a kind of a progressive failure and your unbraced length keeps increasing, which then decreases the... Um, the capacity of the of the strut arm. So you may be increasing increasing the effective length of these members, uh, and typically the the strong axis is considered unbraced in this. And this would be the strong axis is side to side across canyon in this case. And we saw saw one of those uh, gates earlier where there was actually some bracing going across cross stream to to brace the strong axis. With these, when you start getting the flexions, you also need to consider the second order effects when doing the analysis. Um, a lot of times, um, these gates are analyzed in SAP or STAD. So this gets the fragility curve. Again, this is the same one we saw for the static case. And it's the, again, suggested one to use for this. And it as all these fragility curves, they can be discussed as a team and maybe reasons to to alter these um, you know I, I think a comment was made earlier looking at these look a little conservative and um, especially well, once you strip out all the factors of safety and and um, strength reduction factors it makes a little more sense but some cases where maybe all the analysis that you have was done using 36 KSI steel the minimum the minimum yield of that member and we know that it's more than that using that FEMA document it's probably closer to 44 KSI and but the analysis has already been done so maybe there's a way to go and um, put ratios to this and change the fragility curve knowing that the 
capacity of the steel is more than what was analyzed. So that's just one case, one example where you may have justification to go and change this fragility curve. So just some more comments on the fragility curve. Um, the same one for normal operating conditions was used as a starting point. Um, another reason you could consider this conservative and may want to change it is, again, considering that dynamic component that for the short duration loading on these gates. Uh, the amount of change is difficult to predict and will likely be affected by the magnitude of the hydrodynamic loading component and the characteristics of the ground motion. And yeah, another high level analysis should be considered to better capture the response of the gates to seismic loadings. Again, if you do the simpler analysis here and it's inconclusive, that's when you would go to more of a, um, either the 3D finite element or start considering the nonlinear, actually modeling the nonlinear behavior of the steel. So uh, ex example of entry. So here they've developed a system response probability looking at peak ground acceleration versus a pool elevation. Um, in this case, this gate is much is taller than 15 feet, but they basically set a, a threshold, a limit threshold where these lower elevations on the gate would just have very low, very low interaction ratios. And so it's just assume failure is not possible. So kind of set this threshold value of 1585 and did five foot increments after that to help limit the amount of analysis. So you'll see that you, from these uh, interaction ratios, you can then go into fragility curve and estimate the probability for this node of onset of buckling. And so you have 16 different branches here that you're estimating for. So for a finite element analysis, there's different levels, as always with finite element. You can have these uncoupled approach where basically you're just modeling the gate. You're not including the piers, the crest, or the dam. So that's the simplest kind. And then you start moving down to more complicated where you start modeling in the spillway, the gates, the piers, all this modeled in together to see that interaction. And again, that is just becomes, there's are exponentially more difficult and time consuming and expensive to perform those. But depending on the risk, it may be justified to take it to that level. The, the last one there is where you're actually modeling the water in with the gates. So you're not the model's calculating that hydrodynamic force. You're not using Wester guards. It's, it's modeling the water with there and the contact surface between the, the water and the gates. And a, a note about the gate condition. Um, a lot of our gates are old and getting older and 50 plus years and starting to age. And it's uh, navigational projects are especially prone to this type of corrosion and fatigue damage. So just another emphasis on the importance of inspection and maintenance programs for our for our aging infrastructure. This is just a case showing the pretty severe corrosion that's been noted on this gate. All right. So multiple gates. So this similar to the piers where you're considering multiple gate failures. We're talking about Pascal's triangle here, also referred to as the binomial theorem. So I'm not going into great detail on this, but there are the best practices chapter does go into into detail on how to how to calculate this for however many number numbers of piers or gates that you have to come up with the the Pascal's triangle for this. So that comment there generally assume the gates this. Pascal's triangle does assume the gates failure are independent. If gate dependence is thought to be significant, use a ventry method and best practices manual or develop a method considering gate correlation. So there, there are some proposed methods out there for um, considering dependence of gate failure. The multiple gates here just shows again, the probability of failure of one gate was pretty low. That's well, not I shouldn't say that's pretty low, but 0.378 for failure of one gate. You're walking through the failure from one to eight gates, um, but you can see that the probability as you get to seven and eight gates is is pretty low there. And another key note is just when you look at the weighted weighted average of life loss, it's it's still somewhere between one and two of the gates failing, based on that initial probability of failure of one gate. 
So you can take this information and go into, put it in your risk tree as part of your calculation and simulation. And um, this can get this can get pretty cumbersome pretty quick if you look at these eight different scenarios and then you had 16 different branches of that for four pool levels and four seismic load ranges. It can become cumbersome and a lot of, a lot of bookkeeping involved with doing this. And then you can even take this a step further if the life loss, if it's heavily dependent on time of day or seasonality. So you could have further branches coming off from all this. Additional failure modes. So we talked about trunnion pin failure. There's the possibility of a trunnion pin failure or the anchorage failure that we've talked about. Um, peer failure as well, which was a, another that we covered before. So you got to think about um, all these potential failure modes would be leading to the same breach. And if you fail the peer first, then, well, you don't have a gate. So you want to be careful about how you add the probability of failure of multiple potential failure modes that result in the same breach. And I would imagine different agencies consider this. This is the common cause adjustment effect and how to consider that. But that's something you definitely want to be careful of. I would say, I mean, never would, I don't, you just straight up count them, double, uh, you know, add them to each other because that would be double counting um, that potential that potential breach of the reservoir. Um, so there are different ways of combining combining these and considering that. Um, that last point, I, I guess I would take out the word easily. Even the most complicated problems can, can be solved through simulation, the Monte, Car Monte Carlo simulation, but I don't know necessarily that it's always easy. Uh, takeaways, uh, simplify quickly develop these strut arms and the interaction ratios. Um, but to fully capture the response of the gate, finite element model is required. And to fully capture loading, an uncoupled analysis is re a coupled analysis, sorry, that includes the piers and the dam and all that. It's, um, it's complicated, but it's what may be needed if the risk is high. Uh, gate condition and multiple gate bay breaches should be and need to be considered. Do you ever have to deal with dynamic impact loads that you've got? I saw ice loading is absolutely a, a load case. It would be considered, it was considered in more of the normal operating condition, but ice loading is, is definitely, there's a couple case histories of ice loading failure. So the ice load comes at the top, usually at the top. So if the reservoir is full, you're impacting that gate where there's this may not even have a strut arm directly. You know, it's all the strut arms are geared towards the bottom where the highest hydrostatic loads are. And so you see that ice load and it, it wouldn't take a huge load to cause a deflection. And one of those cases where it was debris coming down the river, it was more of a, a ductile failure, just bending, bending that entire skin plate over that may not have resulted in a uncontrolled release of the reservoir, or at least it didn't completely fail the gate. Yeah, so ice loading, I think, is uh, definitely, I mean, there's failure modes of that, so it's proven to be more likely than a seismic failure of a radial gate. Hmm. Any other questions for Adam? Okay. Okay. Oh. your inventory, does this tend to be your risk driver? Is that a what I was seeing is that the risk, well, as far as radial gates, the seismic is typically uh, more of a risk driver than the trunnion friction. Yep. Cody, you agree with that? 